everyone. Hope you're doing fine. Um, we are now going to start the session on peace and security. Um, as you know, obviously, because of what is happening in Ukraine, but also because we are having this event in Poland, and the um, Polish perspective is very important to what is happening in Ukraine, but also to us Greens. Um, so the title of the session is What do Polish and Ukrainian perspective mean for the debate on a green European vision for security? As you know, um, the war in Ukraine shaked a lot of what were Greens Mm, certainties and positions on certain things, and we did a lot of work to, let's say, move on certain debates. Um, so we have four speakers today. Sofia, I don't know if she is there yet, please. Nice to see you. So you're the coordinator, sit wherever you like. <laughs> You're the coordinator of the program Democracy Support and Human Security of the HBS in Ukraine. So by definition, you became a very um, qualified expert on what is happening uh, on the ground. Um, then we have Agnieszka, who is yeah, here. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Agnieszka is, um, is a scientist. She graduated from the Institute of International Relations at the Faculty of Journalism and Political Science at the University of Warsaw. Then she did her PhD in the field of political science, specialized in international relations. Um, and then we have Lena, who is the leader of the Polish Young Greens. Hello. So she's the co-chair of the Polish Young Greens, <laughs> as I just said. And then we have Gwendolyn Del Boscofield, who is a member of the European Parliament, who is notably working a lot on um, the issue of rule of law, especially in Hungary. She's the European Parliament rapporteur on the um, Article 7 procedure on Hungary, but she also knows a lot of things about the European Greens because she was in the committee of the European Green Party for seven years and about basically what is happening with the Greens in the European Parliament. Um, so, Sofia, if that's okay, we are going to start with you, um, with basically the main question being, what is happening in Ukraine? What is the state of play right now? And um, how do you see um, the Polish perspective and how, um, yeah, how what is happening in Ukraine is now shifting the debate in the EU, uh, especially um, with the Polish angle? Thank you, Melanie. Good morning, everyone. And um, it's a great pleasure being here, but it's even the greater pleasure seeing uh, so many Ukrainian speakers and so many questions touching war in Ukraine and how it has an impact on the Greens, on the Green Agenda, and not only Ukraine, but everything beyond Ukraine. Um, what is happening in Ukraine? I mean, you're reading daily the news and you, you, you see it everywhere. I'm, I'm starting my morning, every morning, preparing daily brief for Share the Truth project that we've started on the third day of the war. And this lasts for nearly 140 days that I have these mornings, reading the news and living with the news and what's happening around my country. One of the latest things, let's start with data. That was day, yesterday or day before, the, the Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs said like, there were there was 17,000 strikes on civilian objects in Ukraine done by Russians. Daily, we read about the human rights violations. Recently, OSCE reported on 18 filtration camps in Ukraine. You learn about Ukrainian cities, not just because of their amazing architecture, uh, or the development ideas, but we learn about Ukrainian cities for the fact where the shelling has taken place. This week we've learned about Vinnytsia, which is central Ukraine, relatively safe city. We now call everything relatively safe. Nowhere is safe and nothing is safe. Vinnytsia was a relatively safe city. In the end, we have 23 people killed, and among them, three kids. That was heartbreaking. When I found this news, I was standing on the on a cross, a crossing the road in Brussels. Being safe in Brussels, but reading about the news happening in Ukraine, in relatively safe Vinnytsia. We know about Mariupol, we know about Bucha, Kyiv, Yerpin, and dozens of other cities. 
Mykolaiv, another case. Two universities, relatively short. Universities, the premises which meant about educating people, about educating the next generation. It's again, civilian object. What do we have? We have destroyed institutions. If I, would I like, I, if I were, if I lived there, I would like to attend this university, but most likely there will no longer a chance to do that. Last but not least, um, the article from The Guardian from yesterday, 1,400 new graves identified in Mariupol. Mariupol is a city, uh, you know, now everyone knows about it, where I was planning to have one of my projects this autumn. The idea was to bring some students to show this how the cities relive. In the end of the day, now the project's not gonna take place because there was nowhere to bring them. And this is how we live, and this is how it, what's happening in the end of the day. It's another Saturday morning. For me, it's 143rd day of the war. What's coming next? These were the data, the latest news, but what's coming next? We got the candidate status, and um, I very much appreciate this because this is quite a big push and recognition also of what Ukraine has done over the last couple of years of this transition and readiness to go. But again, just coming back from Brussels, what we see clearly, it's not gonna be a fast track, it's not gonna be easy. Everyone's telling us that's a quite a hard work that you have to do. That's reforms, these are the conditions that you have to work. This is anti-corruption, media law, national minorities law. There are sets of conditions. And this is just the beginning of the long run. The long run, which we have to implement, having shellings in every, uh, all across the country. So on the one hand, we still have to push the reform agenda, and it's, we passed the law. One of the biggest achievements the civil society community has been celebrating was finally the ratification of Istanbul Convention. But this all goes, this reform agenda, which I would like to carry out in a peaceful times, it goes along with air raid alarms. And that's, that's pretty much as it is in, uh, in the end of the day. We were recently asked, so most likely you have a war in Ukraine, so you don't have, to, like, you don't have conditions to work and the civil society that cannot work at this moment. We said like, no, actually everyone works like three times more because you have to be safe and to save your close ones. You volunteer or support any kind of a humanitarian aid uh, efforts or uh, military. And you have to run your projects. So you have like three front lines. You care about your life, you care about your community, and you have to care about your work. So the, the, the burden, and I mean like the, the workload that everyone's carrying is a lot. And the, the crucial thing is, I work uh, with civil society activists and uh, NGOs. My, my two fantastic colleagues are here in the room. Olena is the founder of Green Academy, and Anastasia is my partner and director of Cycling uh, Association of Ukraine. None of them and none of my partners who are remaining in Kyiv or in Ukraine overall didn't stop working. And the idea is all of us, we, we were all pretty much big, the first pacifists, the first calling for nonviolence and speaking about this uh, during our Green Academies that we organize every year in Ukraine. But now, now we are fundraising for Bulletproof West, for gear for, the, uh, for our friends. We check who's safe, who's not. Anastasia, sorry for bringing up the, the, your case, but was 33 days in occupation. And the, but now, and she didn't give up. And now we are all fighting and we are having all of our front lines. And the, we share the green values, but we reconsider these green values. I'm a democracy coordinator. I very much push for democracy agenda. And I see how this grow, grows, uh, how it's called, uh, bottom-up democracy is operating and the civil society have it contributes. It's amazing. But on the other hand, I feel like I want the democracy to be armed. And uh, this is what makes me, I mean, my daily work and what I see makes me reconsider the green agenda, the values that I see in my country and also motivates me not to stop. And I see the same about the civil society that I work with. They do not stop because they know that it's like now having war around we talk about already now, about on the day 140 days, we talk about reconstruction already because we know we cannot stop, because we cannot wait until the end when, uh, when the war will be over. Therefore, 
we have the, already the eco activists and energy activists are talking about what are going to be the next reconstruction projects that to make the cities better. Urban development activists are now discussing what are the needs and checking the needs how to reconstruct cities better. So already now, no one is waiting. People literally are already now talking about reconstruction and how to make the country livable and to, to work further. But the crucial thing for this, that actually to implement this, these projects, is to be, to, uh, that the country starts to be safe at least a little bit. And another idea is that um, uh, to create these conditions that people return. We very much appreciate how Poland and, and many of other EU countries hosted Ukrainians from the very first day. I admire how, how literally the Polish borders were open for crossing for people and people were leaving on the very first days of the war. But also we want to create these conditions in our country that people return and they want and feel that it's safe enough to return. And for this, this requires quite a lot of mobilization. As I said, the EU is clearly saying there's, there will be no shortcut to, be, to get a membership, which means there should be work from the both sides. Ukrainian community, as I see, as I work, I see they are ready to do this. But it's also essential that there is a support from the other side, because as soon as we stop this, the sooner people will return. And also the cost of the war will be smaller for the rest. We see now the feedback we start receiving is, well, there is certain war fatigue that is coming. Winter is coming. The gas prices and the prices people will start receiving bills, with pretty high bills. And we'll pay it with our bank cards, with our cash, from our, literally from our pockets. And then this is where all of us, no matter where we live, we will feel this war in our pockets. Super close. The second thing is, so we talk about the fatigue, we talk about cost of this, and also the third thing, the spending, the military spending and defense spending. These costs, of course, could go for capacity development projects, for development ideas, for uh, building um, industrial parks, or just beautiful parks outside. I mean, I see how uh, the territory next to the river has changed a lot. This is all taxpayers' money. And these taxpayers' money will now will have to go for the defense sector because now the whole Europe, the concept of Europe, has to reconsider how to protect itself. Because at the moment, the military activities, the physical threat, is on the territory of Ukraine. And Ukrainians are pretty much standing keep it, to keep it there and to end it as soon as possible. But we need support. We don't ask to come and to fight instead of us. What, what at the moment everyone is asking, stop buying Russian gas, do the go with embargo, sanctions, get rid of, uh, of Russian media, but in order not, to, not Russian media, but fight this disinformation. This is what's crucial because it can be, it's very well integrated in different spheres. There are a number of things to be done, but it's essential that to stop it as soon as possible, because as I said, winter is coming, we start getting tired, talking about war and reading about war crimes, but it's also what the cost, the money, what could go for amazing parks around, would rather go for defense sector for all of us or to support Ukraine in the end of the day. And, um, well, I would love to have amazing projects and run like uh, seminars on green values in Ukraine. But at the moment, if we don't protect, if we don't provide enough arms, there will be no one for whom to deliver these projects. And people who are right now displaced, those millions, seven millions or something, people who are right now all across the Europe will be the cost to everyone and they will not return and even more people will start coming. And it's essential that we create this safe preconditions for people and safe to, to ensure that people are willing to return. But this is, as I said, I, I'm saying this, uh, first of all, as a Ukrainian, not, a, not as a program coordinator or as a founder of the Green Share the Truth project. I'm saying it as a Ukrainian. What we need at the moment, we need, first of all, arms, we need Further support and not a fatigue because we are not tired. As Maria said, as others are saying, we are not tired. We are doing three times more now, so we don't, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't give up. And we also ask everyone beyond Ukraine not to give up on us, even if it's going to be a bit costly. 
because the cost will be, it will increase, but if we don't stop it now, if we don't cut it now, it will, be, it will take for long. And we'd rather prefer having it to stop it as soon as possible. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm now, yeah, going to, I hope your mic is open. Uh, yeah. Um, now I'm going to ask you, Agnieszka, if you could, because you, so you're a specialist of EU-Russia uh, relationship, but so if you can talk about this, but also um, give us your view on the role that Poland is playing right now um, in this, and also maybe how you feel the positioning of EU member states towards Poland and the Polish society has changed during the, the conflict and what impact it has on the Polish civil society and on the fight for rule of law in Poland, uh, etc. I think your mic is working. Yeah, it is. Uh, thank you very much. It's a huge pleasure to be with you here because uh, I have a strong feeling that uh, we have always to repeat our message that uh, I have also the feeling that I am I have been doing this since the February 2022 and I'm going to do I'm going to do the same today so once again I will um, explain why we as Europe uh, and especially also uh, as Poland, we cannot give up our uh, solidarity with Ukraine. We have to improve our um, uh, politics be because we still have much to, uh, to do. But talking about Polish perspective, I was thinking uh, what to share with you, because I know that I have only 10 minutes. And uh, it's always too short, but um, I was I, I decided to share with you my three conclusions because talking about Poland, we of course might start with um, great uh, compliment that Poland was the main uh, supporter of Ukraine. We were we are still very solid towards our Ukrainian uh, colleagues and friends and families, in fact, uh, but please remember, this is mostly because of Polish people. Um, Polish government uh, has made much, but not um, enough. And this is why we should remember that all, that all these gestures of solidarity and absolute support for Ukrainian people, this is because of Polish people because of grassroots movements. People were going on to the border, were taking the random family and giving them the shelter. So this, we should divide what is the, let's say, what is the success of the government and what is the success of Polish society. We should uh, remember this because this is very important from my perspective. So let's start. I think that we should remember and we should underline that uh, we, as Poland, we have to uh, stress three uh, elements and uh, let's say three conclusions we have. Um, uh, we have, let's say, in July, after half a year of uh, the war in Ukraine. The first consequence for Poland is uh, the security first. Yes, this is the first what we, what we have changed in Poland. Uh, Poland turned out to be a frontline country. And because of this, uh, we turned out also to be a neighbor to an aggressive country, to an aggressor who, uh, which doesn't hesitate to violate the UN Charter, uh, we are next to an aggressor who, uh, which uh, uh, doesn't hesitate to commit war crimes like Bucha, uh, which doesn't hesitate to um, uh, use terror methods like uh, a few days ago in Vinica, uh, because bombing universities and bombing uh, civil, um, let's say, sovereign this is 
terrorism, and we should call Russia a rogue state, finally. Don't be afraid to, 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 to use proper terms. Uh, so this is very important. And for, for Poland, the, the, the very immediate uh, change is the militarization. And I am going to expect more militarization in public, um, more militarization of public language, more militarization in, um, uh, let's say, pol Polish politics. Uh, uh, that's more than sure than today we spent 2% 2, uh, 2 of GDP on, on our armies and it's going to be even more next year. So um, we have a very populist government, so we are going to have a populist and militarized government next year. So we have to be afraid that Poland will have such a face uh, very soon, but uh, of course we also should remember that next year we are just having uh, parliamentary elections, so there is a very small chance for, uh, for a new government. So this is the first um, uh, consequence. The second one is that alliances do matter. Because in Poland, for a long time, we had very long-lasting discussions what to do with Polish security, whether to organize our defense on ourselves, like Israel. But luckily, and, for, and I'm sorry for saying this, but luckily, because of uh, war in Ukraine, now we, as the society, we understood that this is very naive to think about um, uh, building our security only independently, uh, um, without uh, NATO, without uh, integration, further integration with European Union. So for me, this is a very positive consequence that, that uh, we understood that Poland is not a lonely boat on the ocean, uh, on the global on ocean. Um, so we have to be more integrated with um, NATO and we have to think twice um, what to do with our European policy, because this is the problem our government is facing now, what to do, whether to give up um, the conflict with European Union, the, because of um, violating rule of law in Poland or to go on. Uh, and here I am not so optimistic. Uh, so this is the second conclusion that uh, in Poland we finally, we have, uh, we have finally understood that uh, international cooperation really matters. And it doesn't mean that we are losing our independence or as um, many of our politicians claim. And the second um, lesson learned is unfortunately very um, pessimistic. And this is uh, what I am afraid of, that however we are facing uh, the war the next door, but it doesn't impact uh, our populist government. Uh, that means that um, Putin's aggression on Ukraine has become the perfect cover for populist government. Uh, and today we have the problem that, um, for example, next, the next year we are going to have the highest inflation in, in Europe. And what is our government uh, explaining? This is because of Putin, not because of our um, uh, policy failures, yes, of our wrong decisions. This is Putin's, uh, because of Putin aggression. Um, what's more, uh, we are just uh, waiting, we are expecting new um, prices increases on electricity, for example. And what is our government ex talking to Polish people? This is not because of us. This is not because we uh, have wasted millions of euros for green uh, transition, but this is because of Putin, yeah? So that's, yeah, this is why I am absolutely afraid that um, instead of instead of, let's say, 
um, starting to think about a country uh, instead of uh, starting to think, uh, started thinking about security and how to defend Poland from um, economic crisis, um, we are just going on into more populism, into more uh, demagogy in, um, in Pol Polish politics. And these are three conclusions um, um, regarding to Polish, um, Polish, um, let's say, uh, agenda um, uh, and, let's say, Polish politics vis-a-vis uh, Ukraine war, uh, war in Ukraine, and uh, I was thinking also what to, what is important to what what the message as Poland we should give to our European colleagues, how they should understand what's going on in Poland, and I think that uh, what is very important, and this is and this is also uh, and this is also um, how we in Poland understand. Uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, we stress that, and we 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 have noticed that uh, our European colleagues um, have divided into two camps. Uh, the first camp is the peace camp, and the second one is the victory camp. And Poland belongs to the victory camp. Uh, that camp understands that the most important uh, is to allow Ukraine to win, not to stop the war immediately, but to win. Because um, uh, Polish diagnosis on Russia was uh, not naive, it was not Russophobia, but it was um, uh, absolutely based on our um, historical experience. And we, as Lithuania, as Baltic countries, we understand Russian nature of um, aggressive politics. Uh, and we understand, in opposition to some of our European colleagues, that we have to uh, bring Russia to, um, how to say, to have two defeats. The first one in uh, the military, and the second one to make Russia collapse economically because only this way we, um, we are able to avoid the situation when Russia, a few years later, will go back uh, with, a feels and with the strong feeling that uh, it has survived spectacular historical sanctions and nothing and no one will be able to stop it. Yeah? So that's why we in Poland and in Eastern flank understand that peace for Europe, security, European security are absolutely dependent on what we will do now with Russia. Either we will uh, ru make Russia collapse military and economically, or we will give Russia time to leak the wounds and go back uh, with the feeling that no one might stop, stop it. So this is a very important lesson, not only mm, to Poland, but to our European colleagues. And now I'm just finishing. The second and the third uh, lessons are important, but the first one was the basic one. So also as Europe, we should understand uh, that um, the illusion that Russia might be a reliable partner has ended. Yeah, it's no more time to, uh, it's no more um, time for Russia first policy. We have to invest our money, time, and energy to strengthen uh, post-Soviet republics in democratization, in integration with Europe, just to give them chance to be a part of the Western world, not a part of Russian Bližnie Zarubieje, which is a close neighborhood. Uh, so, and this is our role. 
uh, to do this. And the last, uh, and the last um, uh, message is that this is also for us, and I was talking this with Maria in Berlin last time, this is Zeitenwende, this is Zeitgeist. Uh, we should uh, really, um, we should take this occasion just to uh, make a huge step forward as Europe. Uh, I understand, and everyone who is dealing with Russia understands that Russia is afraid of only of a naked power and is afraid of a, a stronger and more powerful um, partners. So in our interest is to strengthen European Union, to improve decision making in European Union and to go further with green transition because Russia depending on oil and gas uh, has wasted the occasion to modernize. Instead of modernizing, Russia has chosen the path of militarization. So that's why cutting all these ties um, in energy with Russia, we might um, weaken Russia very successfully. And this is the first step to uh, our security and the first step to, f to, to independence and, uh, and sovereignty of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think indeed it's very interesting that you show this paradox between a situation that is actually unifying Europe but at the same time strengthening a government that is participating to the weakening of the EU. So it's a paradox that I think we have to yeah, think about. Um, Lena, I'm going to give you the floor now. Um, basically the question, yeah, I hope it still works. Yes. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, what we would like to hear from you is what is the perspective of the youth and how you are um, politically active in this moment in Poland, but also um, between different um, uh, young green movement across the EU. Um, yeah, so give you the floor. You also have 10 minutes, but it's pretty fine to moderate the panel with um, women only because they more or less keep their time. So that's that's cool. <laughs> Yes, I will try to stick to the 10 minutes or less. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so to answer the question, the perspective of the youth on the situation on what security actually means. Um, when it comes to European youth and our Polish perspective, definitely I think this analogy of this or this term that uh, was said today, so the victory camp and the peace camp, definitely we can also see it among the green youth. Um, of course, Poland, also Polish green youth, we belong to this victory camp, but the discussions on security, because um, the discussions on the European level about security are, uh, we see the same division as we see when it comes to just green politics in general. So. Um, we discuss what security actually means, what, how we should approach it. And I think when I realized that there is this big division, once we started discussing uh, among the Green European youth, uh, the question of NATO, whether we are for or against, because as Greens, in principle, we are pacifists. And NATO, for many countries, represents war and uh, aggression, um, which we as Poles, I don't think Polish people look at it this way, because to us, alliances, international cooperation equals security. This is the certainty that we won't uh, be left alone and that there will be a bigger brother to just help us defend in case, for instance, Russia decides to attack us next. And I think I was really, it really struck me when I learned the arguments of the Western youth when we were discussing NATO, because to me, it was always obvious that, yes, I, I wish we had the world without armies, without weapons, but we, it's impossible. And we see like, the war in Ukraine really showed that it is impossible to, to just pretend we can live without defense and investing into armies because, yes, there is a need for defending ourselves. And I feel that being anti-NATO is a sign of privilege, which on one hand, I wish 
Polish uh, young youth could also have, because that would mean that we are strong on our own and we don't need to worry about defending ourselves, just in case. Um, and I think that, yes, as I mentioned already, for Polish people and for Polish youth, um, security means cooperation on the international level, unification, and setting specific boundaries, not pacifism at all costs, because, as I said, it's we are realists and we realize that it's not possible to just close our eyes and say, yes, we are. We, we won't fight, we don't want any armies, we don't want any weapons because, yeah, it's we can just do, deal without it. No, we don't. Since the war broke out, there are multiple times myself, I was worried that what would happen in case I would wake up just as I did on the 24th of February and I learned that something happened in Poland. I live in Germany right now and I cannot count how many times I was trying to come up with a plan. What if? What if it happens? How I can get my family, my parents, to meet to Germany? Because I have also this privilege. I could quickly just arrange, uh, arrange transport and they would be safe. But So, of course, this is not comparable to the stress that the Ukrainian nation goes through. But the threat is very close to us as well. And this is something that is not reflected in the opinions and uh, arguments that the uh, Western youth presents, which is understandable. Again, the threat is farther away, but when we are discussing and somebody's questioning my stand or the stand of Polish young Greens on this, I just, I cannot help but just think this is privilege, which nobody should be shamed for, but at the same time, when you are privileged, you need to realize that you need to understand your privilege. You need to know um, what it entails and why you should listen to others who might understand the situation a bit better. Um, and this is something I wish we could, I think on all levels, not only among youth, but also um, just in the general discussion, international discussion, to just say that what you can do is just listen and rely on our translation of the situation because we're closer, we understand this better. And I keep stressing this, every single time when we are discussing this on the European level among the youth that we need to not just close your eyes and tell us you know better because yes, you can. For you, this NATO is a sign of this and that, but you don't have to worry and you don't have to come up with this plan how to transport your parents away from the war and what you would do in just in case. So, that's um, essentially the message I think Polish and Greens would like to send, um, to just please listen and realize what, what we are saying because the, the threat is just, it's close. And without, essentially just without the victory of Ukraine, we won't be able to have peace in Europe at all. And then there won't be question whether we should have NATO or whether we should have armies. It will be just a question who can survive. Pathways that youth could explore to exert, ex, um, exert pressure on the politics and the general status quo is it, it's a very difficult point and question to answer because if we knew, I, don't, I think we will be in a different place right now. But there are a lot of youth movements that are very vocal right now and are just trying to push a change. And they are mostly, as I see, activist-based movements. It's usually, I mean, political movements are also pretty prominent and we are trying to do our best. But of course, at the forefront are the activists who are usually climate activists or just young people who are fed up and are just trying to do, just unite and and just change by, by doing. And at first I was very skeptical because there's always this debate whether activists should be political, whether we should, um, politics should be concerned with activism and activists should be concerned with politics. And of course, things are not always black and white. They, there's, there's always this gray area and things are intertwined in many ways. Um, but I was wondering, because there's this debate whether we should change how politics is done, because activism is about getting 100%. You're asking for something and you're not looking for a middle ground. You just want it because you understand there's this sort of pressure. And I think the best example to illustrate this is the, the climate, um, climate movements. They ask for 100%, they are not trying to ask for 50, as politicians often do. And 
So the question is whether we can actually do politics asking for 100%, even if we have this sort of choice and uh, privilege to actually still talk about 50% if, if we, our house is on fire, as is often said. And at first I was very critical because I thought that many activists, even though they're quite effective, they are not they often turn out not to be great politicians, and it comes down to uh, preparation, I feel. But I'm also, I, I personally have a very like um, idealistic outlook on politics. For me, this is a service. And many people who just get into politics, they execute their own vision. And sometimes it's very hard for them to function in the system where we have to compromise. And But we see that this is not helping, and even this 50% creates tensions and creates conflicts. And that means that the system is stopping to work. And I think soon we will have to decide and reevaluate whether politics, as it is done right now, can even function. And I think for my generation, it cannot, because we already expect different things, and we are already asking for the 100%. And we are trying to do more radical politics. And we use this word radical, but in a very um, positive sense here. So I think we will see a big shift and maybe this is also in the context of, of security, uh, this situation, uh, this uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, maybe this is like another push to just to a change. And at the end of the day, I wish we didn't have to uh, have this situation, but it might just turn our politics and put it on a different path, which might be more effective for the future because the world, as I see it, is just only getting worse and we have more and more complications. Um, and my generation might change it, but we need different tools and different setups. And what the youth can also do, and I wish uh, it, it would, is just to prepare. Again, if we are going to do activist politics, and I really hope we do because, again, we cannot be asking for 50% anymore, um, the youth, to do it well, needs to learn, learn, and learn. Needs to learn new skills and prepare for being a politician, just being this greater. Every, every generation says that they will be a better one than the previous one, and it's usually not the case, um, because we are all just repeating the same mistakes. But I really hope that if not my generation, my children will be those who will actually do things the, the right way, in the better way, and not repeat the mistakes we've been, we've been making. Um, and I think that my generation, that's, that's why I'm, I'm still hopeful, even though I'm just very critical when it comes to these idealistic ideas, is that my generation, we have this very natural way of just grouping and associating ourselves. And I think that the, the way we can win is just to stand together and not just play everybody for themselves. So, and we do it very well as the climate strikes, as different movements shown that we are very good at organizing ourselves and asking for what we want, and we can exert pressure. So this is definitely how we can move forward. And again, I wish we didn't have to do it right now, and I wish so many young people didn't have to sacrifice so much to just basically ask for security and for air to breathe in the future, also for their children. But if this is needed, we will do it, uh, and we will do it together in a group, and hopefully this will just change how, how everything is done in 50 years. If I will be ever sitting in a panel like that again, I will, I will be just talking and reflecting back on how certain bad events in the 20s or 21st century actually created a situation that we are living in a better world right now. Better because finally somebody took, put their foot down and, and created different infrastructure for how politics and activism is done. Yes, I think this is, I, I hope I answered uh, the question yes, on the perspective of the youth. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, that's, that's good that you also talked about the debate on, on NATO. That's, I think, something that came across all different uh, youth organizations out of the Greens, but also Green parties in general. Um, and that you talked about how we do politics and whether we are, to what extent we can continue to try to compromise and what is the price for this, because now I'm going to give the floor to someone who first had to discuss about all these things, including NATO in the European Parliament, which is a place where you can ask for 100%, but you always get something around 50, uh, because that's the place for compromise. So um, basically the question is, uh, Gwen, can you 
tell us all the like when the war started um it obviously shaked a lot of um, positions of the greens and i guess there were a lot of debates inside of the group on sending weapons on spending suddenly a lot of money on military expenditures on nato um so could you explain us how how it went the, the debate inside of the Green family in the European Parliament. And maybe also if you could tell us what impact this debate had on other issues like um, what we do with the rule of law, um, what we do with the enlargement procedure, like how this situation when it comes to the war also impacted the way we deal with other topics uh, we were already dealing before. I think you have a mic, yeah, I great. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, indeed, the, the Ukraine war, of course, was a, a, um, a quit something that triggered new debates, uh, accelerated some, degraded some um, uh, in 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 our group, in the parliament, and then in the into institutional discussion between the three institutions, of course. Um, for our group, um, I think that the first thing. That has to be said is that it reinforced or at least deepened a number of positions that we had already um, and that we then pushed even more and and it on on these aspects there were basically no debate but there was even more uh, the wish to to push on this of course it's it's the idea of cooperation the idea of unity um, and the idea of political coordination because if you are if you are to put more money for military uh, at least you want a European coordination and not a, a 27 national coordination. And it comes back to something that you talked about, about every country thinking it's defending itself. And for once, there was this idea of a European defense. Of course, um, it strengthened unity. Uh, I will come back on some aspects that have been said, maybe sometimes with the sacrifice of, of some Polish specific debates, for example, um, and and it's and it and it uh, and we asked for even more cooperation. We also, of course, uh, used the situation to to um, um, focus on the fact that we needed transparency every time. We needed scrutiny of parliaments on how the money is used and how these military aspects come in, and and control of arms. And of course, we always say that. Um, even in war, human rights um, are, are, are a fundamental thing. It also, of course, uh, but that I think it, it comes without saying, it also, if, of course, uh, strengthen our debate on climate issues and energy. And it, um, it has the paradox that it, had, it has brought back some coal <laughs> to be functioning again in Germany and France. Um, and the winter is coming and we, will, we don't exactly know how it will turn. But it, it had the effect that suddenly uh, everyone was, was saying, saying we need uh, to get out more quickly from fossil, un um, fossil fuels. Um, so this is, of course, it made our discourse relevant also on uh, uh, and autonomous energy uh, and, and all of this. And then, of course, it strengthened our um, uh, positions on the enlargement, the question of the Balkans, um, the fact that they had been put on the side for a long time, and with Ukraine asking for a, a, a quicker a step to European Union, uh, w it, it allowed us Greens to recall that we needed to address the situation of Montenegro and of Macedonia, which are two member states States that are fully complying with a number of what we are asking and are still not um, uh, seeing their path to European Union going speedy. So this is this. These are the main things where we were basically just reinforcing and and enriching our positions. And then, of course, there are um, those topics where where it was more difficult. It doesn't mean that we were fighting or anything, but it did uh, um, make us debate. The first one, and I think it was really um, uh, the, the sentence Maria said was very nice, um, all of the question of arming peace. Um, indeed, um, history of Green Parties uh, in a number of our member states is from pacifist parties. It is a very common um, history of our parties in France, in Netherlands, in Germany. I mean, very, very often, and it is one of our um, main trends. Um, 
and it doesn't mean that the, it's, it's, it's a naive way of seeing peace, and it doesn't mean that we haven't had for years t discussions about uh, wars, because wars have been happening everywhere, sadly, on the planet, and we had to, to, to decide what we would do about it in each of our parties. But of course, for the first time, it became very relevant and very close and very urgent to take decisions, which we could have always a bit put on the side and have in a very theoretic way. For the first time, it was no more theoretic. Honestly, it didn't make that debate much debate in the group. It is. It was very clear for everyone that the situation meant that we had to uh, put more money for, for arms and for security, and it's not indeed what we think uh, is the priority in time of peace. We, we always defend uh, other means or other, other use for money, but this was was a particular moment. And once again, we would always say, you know, but this means first that we need political coordination. Second, that we want not France to go on augment, uh, uh, increasing its own budget, but it's a more coordinated money, um, and and free, of course, parliamentary scrutiny. But we had to come to this very difficult. Um, uh, realistic consideration that we had to arm peace. Yes, it happens. Um, we had the discussion on NATO there again uh, on a geopolitical uh, uh, debate. We often have these um, different point of views um, in France um, and 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 in cer certain uh, southern country. Um, as, as you said in a very nice way, we have this privileged way of seeing things that America is um, not uh, a protection and, and we have been always very criticizing America and then you might have heard of some of the uh, uh, important uh, French member, uh, politics members from, from all uh, political sides in France being very uh, sort of uh, in a defiant um, um, position towards USA for years now, and NATO is uh, symbolizing the domination of, of USA for a lot of our green or leftist people in, in France and, and a number of other member states. Um, so this is indeed a complicated discussion. We always have very prudent words on NATO, even today, when we did our last paper on security and peace, that was the major discussion. There is, they, you have to not forget uh, also that we have um, country member states that are still not wanting to align in any way. Yes, Finland has changed its position, for example, Denmark, but it's not the case of Austria, for example, which is still a country that doesn't want to align, and our Austrian Greens are very close to this position. Um, so the wording that we use for NATO is always very prudent, but there again, I don't think it, it stirred that much disagreement, we just needed to find the, 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 the prudent wording. Um, and we, I think we acknowledge the fact that it is um, a privileged way of seeing things, that as you said, we shouldn't be ashamed, but we should acknowledge it, that um, it's because we could see things like that for years, um, and, and hopefully this debate will always exist because it's healthy that the debate exists. Now, the third issue, which was not a debate between us at all, but is um, a difficult situation for us Greens in the European Union debate and the inter-institution inter discussion, is the rule of law issue. Um, this is an issue where we Greens have been at the forefront um, on a lot. Um, we have the reports on that. We have the, the, the we are the one pressuring Commission, Council, and all of this. We are the group really always fighting on Hungary and Polish and trying to be the voice. Other groups are, but we we even more than others are trying to be the voice of Polish and Hungarian society. Um, and of course, in this debate, in this very specific moment since Ukraine war, the Polish situation has considerably change on the European Union stage. Um, when I became a, a member of the European Parliament in 2019, it's my first term, uh, Poland was very, very isolated. It was the isolated member state. Uh, PE, you know, uh, all the groups would be very unhappy with, with um, Poland, except from ECR, the group where 
the government party um, is. Uh, all the uh, in council, I would always hear very bad thing about the Polish government, uh, and basically it it was it was the the, the isolated um, uh, government. And Hungary was not because at the time Fidesz. Uh, Orban's um, uh, party was still in the big group in parliament. There was still a lot of, mem of um, chief of government that would have good relationship with him. Even Angela Merkel was a bit sometimes um, prudent with Viktor Orban. Um, and, and basically, there were, he was very good in dealing with things, so he would be still in the group of, of uh, in the big group. Uh, and in three years, we have been seeing a complete shift. Now, Hungary is very isolated, and Poland is no more. And in fact, even Poland government has managed to be a bit in the center of things these last month. And this is, of course, very, very uh, concerning for us and dangerous. How do we do with this? How do we do when we also know all the hypocrisy that's behind it? I mean, in the in the month, in in yeah, it was one month after the the, the beginning of the war when all the refugees were coming in Poland. Poland, and we had this discussion with lawyers and judges, these uh, very lawyer, uh, judges that have been fired by the government or so sanctioned that their life is so hard, and all of these lawyers that are fighting, and you know, they were the ones saying, I have I have a family in each of the rooms of my house. The government is not doing anything about the, 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 um, the refugees, and we are being told, yes, but you know, we should we should basically be indulgent with your government because now you are welcoming all these um, uh, refugees. So we should do something about you. And and we we were in this very bizarre situation where, in fact, the government it was instrumentalizing a, a very specific situation, and and there was a sort of a double punishment for the leftist. Uh, um, activists that were at the same time the one fighting the government and at the same time the one the more fighting next to the refugees and, and on this. Um, so this is something we have to be very careful of. Um, we have a real uh, threat that civil society in Poland would be sacrificed in the name of unity, in the name of facing uh, the, the Russian um, uh, Putinization and, and the Russian uh, fight against rule of law, uh, which is, as you said, very paradox. Um, so this is one of our, our, our big thread, and this is a debate we have a lot. How do we, Greens, be careful in this debate uh, to, 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 to find the path where indeed we work with, um, where we need Poland to go on um, being this fighter against Russia, uh, at least in the symbols and the values and all of this and what they say, um, but we still go on criticizing what is happening very strongly and we are not indulgent and we are not giving money to a government if it's for them to badly use it uh, and not use it for the welcoming of the refugees and for reconstructing things and for recovery, etc., etc. Um, three quick issues that I wanted to, to focus on is the gender issue. Um, uh, I, I think that what, uh, how um, rape uh, um, in Ukraine was used once again, uh, and it's, we know that it's for centuries, millennia has been, been a habit, but how rape has been used as a war um, a weapon um, has not made, I feel, enough debate in France and has not been used. And also how the, the, what's the, how uh, immediately, you know, women and children came to all of our countries and then w men stayed and, and how uh, women are facing and, and coping with the situation. Uh, I think that this gender issue um, is not even enough, we're not working enough on it, women in war. Well, how we, do we deal with this? I think it's even more relevant to talk about this topic in Poland, where the attack against women is one of the worst um, attacks on human rights of this government, uh, and how they are the one really being sacrificed. Um, there's a, I, I just wanted to also um, tackle the issue of a very specific, uh, bizarre dynamics uh, at the moment in all member states. We, we, we are in, in a moment where discussions are going to be different and situations are going to be strange. We have all the frugal countries that they don't want to put money anymore in European Union and how are they going to deal with the situation. We have indeed uh, the reinforcement of the discussion of we need to 
open our arms to Balkans and, and Europe is also there uh, and, it's, and, and we need to protect them from, um, from uh, uh, Russian. It has also meant that countries like the, the Baltic countries have stepped in the debate much more than they had, they had always been. The, the Baltics country would be very silent in most of the debates in council, in commission and all this. And the Baltic countries are really speaking up much more. So we're seeing an involvement of these three countries that I think is very interesting um, and will maybe also help shaping things with the Eastern countries. Um, and then, uh, the last thing I wanted to, to, um, to signal is, of course, the discussion on, on refugees. Um, we manage with this crisis to uh, use this uh, thing that existed for a long time in our text, the temporary protection. It had, we had not managed to use it for the Syrian people. Um, we, we left them on the side. For the Ukrainian, we managed. It's absolutely amazing. It, you, you have to, in a country like France, there is one place where a Ukrainian refugee will arrive and you will get all info. And the info goes not only from uh, how do you do your papers, but uh, how you can find a job, how we can help you with housing, how can we send your children to school, how can we help you with uh, benefits, welfare benefits and all this. Something that we have never been able in this European Union to provide to any refugees uh, before, uh, even those that managed, they managed after 20 years of very hard, difficult situations. Um, for the Ukrainian, we used it. I do hope that this will be an example that we can and that it facilitates everyone's life, in fact, that it's not that difficult and that we should use it more often. Thank you. Thank you very much to the four of you. Um, I'm now opening the floor for questions. We are basically on time. I mean, we kept our time. People before us were late, but <laughs> that's not, yeah. Uh, so if anyone has, yeah, has questions, I see a lot of people, that's cool. Um, so maybe I will collect Yeah, a like them. three maybe, and then we answer so, and so we take another round. You, oh, oh, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Tomasz Ganow uh, from Poznań in Poland. Uh, as a, um, on an occasion of talking about the rule of law, uh, I have my remark that we should not understand it in a narrow sense, that it's only about courts and tribunals, uh, because if we r treat it seriously, we see that in Poland, uh, because I know uh, this politics uh, the best, uh, better than other countries. Uh, so in Poland, I see that the ignorance of rule of law is not only in the uh, governing party, but also in the biggest oppositional party, like it's uh, Platforma Obywatelska, because uh, the European programs like infrastructure and environment uh, have have certain goals, uh, and we c can complain that these goals are not uh, enough green, and we mm, think about uh, new programs, but. Uh, the practice was that even uh, such a minimum uh, green program, uh, which is included in this uh, big operational programs, uh, they are just ignored. And the European Union believes that the people on the place uh, care about this program and mm, control uh, does not exist because this uh, 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 documents uh, for money are accepted by the ministry or a uh, province uh, governance uh, and in Poland uh, they are just happy that the capital is coming to the country and uh, they don't care about development, they care about the growth. So the local companies are happy because they build something, but they build, for example, a city highways, and the uh, projects are 
uh, done with a pretext. So we improve a little bit a tram track, but we built a huge uh, auto uh, highway, and so this is like this. Thank you. And you, yeah. Thanks a lot for the floor. My name is Ephthemius Rafael Angelis, and I live in Athens, in Greece. So I would like to state that uh, even if I acknowledge the, the need that the Eastern countries have for NATO, I would like to state that it's not a privilege for some countries. It's also, like, a NATO criticism, it's not a privilege because, in exa for example, in Greece, when like both Greece and Turkey are in NATO, and NATO funds for uh, weaponry in both countries, and actually it's NATO behind the tension, and uh, Greece like spends a lot of partition of the GDP for weaponry when we could invest the same money in alternative, in sustainable resources, in um, sustainability, I mean, in, in this case, it's not that we criticize NATO because we have an anti-USA narrative. It's, a, it's just that we criticize NATO because, for us, it causes a problem. Because if uh, there is an invasion of Turkey in Greece, no one is going to help us from NATO. And I think that this criticism is more than, like, a, it's you know, we can, we can use it in order to find alternatives as a, an alternative might be a European army or common safety policy, but in a real pan-European federalistic level and um, not just creating mechanisms like Frontex. For example, Frontex is a mechanism that violates human rights in, in borders like Frontex participates in, in pushbacks of refugees. So instead of, in European level, creating useless mechanisms, we might use the anti-NATO criticism in order to improve our union and find common, realistic solutions to our problems for all European countries in a pan-European level. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, Eva Sufi, Stef um, First of all, I'm very happy to have 100% female debate on this issue uh, because I believe that we have some issues and topics and positions and uh, lights that we probably would not have if we had 100% male uh, debates, as it's usually the case in this topic. Uh, so uh, I have just uh, one question for Gwendolyn and one question for Lena. For Gwendolyn, what do you think about uh, European defense if uh, there is some progress because we are uh, there are so many years that we are speaking about this European defense. Is it still a new topic, or, or are we a little bit uh, going uh, 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 progress on this topic? And to Lena, I know that you are uh, interested and you work on digital security, and uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, digital war of information. And uh, we, we uh, have a lot of articles in Poland about uh, uh, ideology of uh, Dugin, Alexander Dugin, who is uh, one of uh, uh, advisors of Putin on, the, uh, on this, uh, how to uh, how to use this uh, digital war of information uh, in this uh, uh, cold war or war for power. So what, is, what do you think about it, about this uh, protection, about this uh, disinformation and uh, using the uh, internet for that? Thank you. And, and one more here. Uh, so, sorry, I don't remember who was first. <laughs> okay. Thank you. My name is Eva Dries. I come from Warsaw. Uh, I would uh, like to comment uh, about the Ukraine and Russia that it was kind of obvious if you observed uh, the history and the moves of Russia that the, the aggression will be uh, just 
going forward. So since the Chechen wars, since the aggression on Georgia, and uh, then the Crimea, and there was this famous letter of the Polish intellectuals, including Professor Bartoszewski, which was warning the West uh, so as not to repeat the mistake of appeasement, which was made towards Hitler. So uh, they were warning not to appease Russia, because it will end like this, that Russia will move forward with this uh, aggression. So I would like to... Uh, uh, turn your attention to the fact that uh, European companies, despite all these hostile acts of Russia and aggression on the neighboring countries, they pursued with making business. And uh, I mean, not only gas, but also in very sensitive areas like uh, defense. Uh, and even now, this year, uh, after the start of the war, uh, they say, okay, we will not make interest uh, like business in gas, but why not make some uh, nuclear deal? I mean, one of the French companies. So I think our uh, task now is to make this huge pressure on the politicians and on business and on uh, the companies so as not to uh, make this uh, happen again, that we have such ties of the companies and so on. And when the crisis comes, they say, oh, we cannot afford to cut connections with Russia because we are so financially uh, dependent. And the other issue I would like to uh, raise here is the issue of human rights and um, in, the tech, in the context of the COVID. So I f see this huge threat that the uh, product vaccine mandates, uh, how there is such a big risk of human rights violations and they uh, took place in European countries and also in other democracies like Canada and Australia. And I think that our biggest strength uh, and the future of uh, the citizens of Europe is the human rights and is the main value which we should defend. So we should take care of that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'll be very quick. <laughs> okay. So, hello. Uh, my name is Yoon. Oh, it's weird hearing my voice. <laughs> uh, so, apologies for my pronunciation, but to Anjeska, you were talking a lot about how, for example, governments like to push the blame on external factors such as the war in Ukraine and then they abandon their responsibility for citizens. Because I feel samely about the situation in the UK, because we had a lot of corruption with like COVID scandals and just spending like it was 33 billion on like a contract tracing system that didn't work, for example. And that, and that is a factor in inflation. So my question would be like, how do we get governments to take responsibility to care for their citizens while also keeping support for Ukraine as well, and not just blaming Russia as the boogeyman and actually doing something about it rather than just blaming it. OK, thank you very much. I propose that we start uh, the other way around. So I'm going to first maybe give you the floor, Sofia, for the, I think, um, the question before the last question on whether it's actually accurate to say that the aggression was obviously coming and that we uh, had elements to uh, foresee it. Which one you prefer? Well, um, that's a very fair point because uh, in 2014 uh, we saw that how, how it all started. Then we had Minsk agreements and there was sort of a, there's going to be a ceasefire, but ceasefire never happened that was like constantly violations of the ceasefire. And that was like literally believing Russia that they will stop at one point. No, that's a quite a risky business. But it's not only about that it was, it, indeed it was clear something like this more gonna come. Me personally, I would still trying to deny the fact that they will attack Kyiv. Like maybe it's my tunnel vision, but I was still like trying like, I didn't want to accept this fact, but it happened. And now I know like, Yes, it was pretty clear that they, they will never allow and they will never recognize Ukraine as an independent state and moving into European uh, Union direction or any other direction than Russia. 
Another aspect what's crucial to talk about today's war is colonial uh, ambitions that Russia had. And now we understand that what's happening at the moment, this is this imperialist approach that Russia was having for years, literally for years. So it, we, we talk here from 1990 and even before, because we talk about how Russia was fostering this energy dependence, industrial dependence, how they were eradicating any uh, signs of identity. Even in art, you will often see Russian artists, but rarely said, saying Ukrainian artists. So now when we look today, we see this, what we have the situation, the attack is something that was happening already preparing for many, many years, because again, Russia would never would like to accept or uh, take any other direction that Ukraine would take than Russia. And therefore, indeed it is. One maybe more remark, this is also to the panelists, because we, we talk about this, we cannot sacrifice right now the civil society and the human rights. Indeed, I mean, sacrificing, many, making any con uh, concessions in terms of land, of human rights, equals the same. If we say, like, we, we, we give up on human rights, it's a victory to, to Russia. If we give up on civil society, it's a victory for Russia. If we give up on Ukraine, I mean, this is a victory for Russia, but a big loss for everyone. Therefore, here I would say, like, we should be really having this unity as it is at the moment, but rather, rather than divide, because the divide will mean, again, this is a victory for Russia, but a loss for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now going yeah, to give the floor to Agnieszka. I think basically the first and the last questions yeah. were more yeah. uh, for you. So yeah, uh, more or less. Yeah. Rule of but flow. the last one was absolutely for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but let's start w with Poznan question. Um, uh, you know what I what what you were mentioning. It's absolutely a very important issue for Poland, because just imagine uh, when Poland was joining European Union in 2004, uh, we were believing that this is the end of history, yes, that we are just stepping the heaven and every, our life um, will be good for rest of our life, our lives. So uh, what we have wasted this is an occasion to work on civic education yeah we forgot to teach our young generation that european union is not only money this is not only about um, let's say comfort life but this is uh, these are human uh, rights this is um, this is um, uh, let's say rule of law and and we spoiled that occasion yes i do not blame exactly only peace government but i blame all our governments uh, that were in that were ruling our country uh, for so many years since 2004 they were talking about everything but um, about education, about critical thinking. You know, this is the problem. We have to go back to the roots and start talking about, const not only about constitution, but also about basic uh, rights, basic human rights and our obligation as citizen. Uh, so this is the, th this is the problem. This is the, the failure we have to make up very quickly, because if not, we have you know, we have to be ready for more populism, for more right-wing parties, for more, uh, let's say, radicals. Yeah, I am really afraid of our next elections because uh, I predict that peace government will peace um, uh, will win, but not with uh, the majority in uh, in the parliament. But I am afraid about the support for our extra 
our alt-right party, which is Confederacja, and Confederacja, this is absolutely, not only, these are not only populist, but these are very dangerous people because they are very influenced by Dugin, by Kremlin, they are talking uh, about more, not only conservatism, they are talking about making Russia in Poland, yes, about um, making Russia be similar to, let's say, yes, Aga is, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it was not a very, uh, yeah. That was a pretty very, large yeah. question. Okay, so this is one thing. And another thing, uh, f f is another, uh, the answer to you is that, you know, I am, I am asking the same question because uh, I, am, I would like uh, my government, um, okay, this is, these are right-wing uh, politicians, but they should think about people and the country. And uh, I think that they should take res responsibility in our upcoming elections. So we have to vote, um, um, let's say, like, do you remember Navalny, uh, intelligent, uh, smart voting? Yes, we have to vote smart. Um, you know, the idea of Navalny is very actual in Poland. So um, I think that this is one thing, but... Don't vote for the Tories. Yeah, That's the yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 we have... To, That's yeah. the solution. And you know, these both answers are combined because without uh, civic education, Polish people very often, they, they are not prepared for voting. We don't, we don't read... Um, programs, political programs, we do not understand what is the left and what is the difference uh, between the left and the, the, the right. What, what does it mean, peace government, whether it is not only conservative, but these are um, much more than conservative. They are, um, they are ready to implement uh, traditional values like in the past President Putin was uh, implementing in, in Russia. A peace government is ready to violate human rights, uh, to fight opposition, to close uh, independent media. Uh, of course, I do not expect that we will have uh, Navalny and uh, such activists will, be, will end up in a jail, but you know, we are very close to Russian path, and this is why I am absolutely afraid, and I am calling my 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 Polish um, colleagues, my Polish friends, uh, and Poles generally to smart uh, to vote smartly next next year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lena, I'm I'm going now to ask you if I think the question on. Uh, NATO and uh, Greece uh, was directly uh, directed to you. And then the, the question on uh, digital security and the role of internet in, in peace and security. Uh, yes, so when it comes to NATO and the Greek-Turkish conflict, I think, of course, the situation is very complex. And saying that every single country that's anti-NATO has the same sort of reasoning would be or would be oversimplifying it. And, but it's still, I think that, um, of course, even though there are different reasons, still in this debate right now, when we are talking about the defense and defending Ukraine and Baltic countries, Poland, it's still a privilege to say, no, we should, but I'm, it's still a privilege to say that we can do without. It. Of course, I, I agree with you that we should be looking for better solutions and maybe have European army, maybe just find another way and ideally find a way so that we never have to have this debate again. But I think right now we cannot, I think it would be very, um, very irrational or irresponsible to spend time looking for new solutions when we need to act now and we need to take certain steps right now. And again, I'm not saying NATO is an ideal organization and I love everything about this, but it's a promise of, of security for me as a Polish citizen. So that's, I think, even though I agree with you and this is not as simple as uh, we can just put into word privilege, uh, it is still a privileged position in a way to just maybe not be aware of certain reasons and certain phenomena 
uh, and to say, no, we don't want it, and, but what then we do instead? NATO is currently um, supporting the war efforts or the defense of Ukraine, and saying no to it and just cancel it is, is wrong. I mean, in Germany, for instance, I, I, I live in a fairly political city, and there's a lot of students who are interested in politics. It's mostly green, mostly leftist uh, options. And I see a lot of banners saying the legalized NATO, fuck NATO, different things. And for me, it's just, it's just very interesting to see just after the war, uh, the war broke out. The banners weren't there, or maybe they weren't so prominent before, and they are there now. And we're talking about defending a country in Europe, which is very close to Germany. So this is this big dissonance I see, and something I just don't understand, because maybe I'm just aware of too many things, and I have to be aware of too many things. So that's what I mean by privilege. Um, and when it comes to disinformation, this is a very interesting topic. Um, first of all, there's a difference between disinformation and misinformation. Uh, disinformation is spreading purposefully information that is wrong for different, different purposes. Whereas misinformation is spreading information that is wrong, but by accident, by believing that for instance, something is this or that, but it's actually not that, but you just haven't checked or you haven't, you, know, you haven't done your research and you're just passing the information on. Russia has been excellent at spreading disinformation for years. And it was mostly visible in the Balkans, where there was this big full-fledged campaign on, um, on anti-EU, essentially. So there was a big infiltration of information just spreading anti-EU co communications and information. And it was working. There are studies done. It was working. It was really changing the narrative and the public view on the EU. And right now, during this war, uh, disinformation is, is essentially one of the bigger weapons because it influences our responses all around the globe. And we can see it, and it changes also Polish debate. There's a lot of dis <laughs> disinformation that people believe in because it's usually very, um, very black or white, very simple messaging, something that it's easy to fall for. And people just don't have this sort of... Um, tools to distinguish what's right or wrong, and they're just too lazy to, to do their research. But of course, like if we have media, we want to just get the information from there. Not everybody has time to do some research. And I think the key here, and that's what the EU has been doing for years as well, is to just educate people on critical thinking and on finding information that's correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, I've just learned that we, we really have to yeah. uh, finish soon. So Gwen, if you can answer in one sentence uh, <laughs> about the European Defense Union in one sentence. <laughs> Okay, there was a few other questions, but I can answer only this one. Um, I, we're not advancing that well, no. Uh, it's still more about just adding money to buy weapons. Uh, a bit of thinking of uh, autonomous supply chains and all of this, and a bit of thinking about coordination. But then we would go in a lot of discussion on unanimity and all of this. But um, uh, of course, uh, what happened with the Hungarian government, especially on the sanctions and all of this, I, th I think is, on the other hand, opening the mind of a lot of, of governments on the fact that we need to advance on, on some political coordination that are uh, not threatened by one member state uh, when it wants to take hostage a topic. So uh, this is, I think that we have hope um, on, on a, a work that would be a holistic, uh, with a lot of criteria of human rights and all this thinking behind it. But for the moment, honestly, it's more just about adding money. Thank you very much. That's, yeah, you want to say, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much, all of you.